Amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so here's my question as we start out this morning. When we say the word neighbor, what do we mean? Uh, probably everyone has their own idea and connotation, but today it's generically applied to people near us. Whether it's the people who live next to our home or on our block, um, or broadly we think of people we come into contact with, people who we walk by on the street. Um, and most often, in, if you're like me, we've been conditioned to think that, especially in our day, that neighbors are, are just anyone, anywhere, complete strangers. And so often when we use biblical terms, we use biblical references in a modern connotation, we weaken the understanding of it. Um, and so before we apply the text, there's an important concept that we need to understand uh, before we can figure out what this, this text means for us. We need to understand how the original readers would have read it. So the term neighbor is not or was not an impersonal term to them. So they had a more meaningful understanding of neighbor. The Hebrew word reah means friend. It means close friend. It means someone who you know well and is dear to you. So think about this for a moment. Now, we don't understand this here because if you're like me, you don't know your neighbors very well. I know my neighbors on a first name basis, um, but we don't know our neighbors very well. But this was not so for the Israelites. If you lived in a town, you were born there, you grew up there, you died there. Most of the people were from your, your tribe, if not your immediate family. How well do you think they knew their neighbors? When they said neighbor, it was, it was a term of intimacy. It was a, a, a term um, of, of, en, of endearment, someone who they actually knew and treated like a neighbor. They're a communal culture. They lived out in the open. They weren't hidden in our backyards like, like, like we are. They would, they would share resources. They would walk by each other on the street every day. They would be in each other's homes. They would discipline each other's kids. When they heard the word neighbor, that's what they heard. They didn't hear individualists like us who were kind of trained by the culture around us, um, often with accusations levied against Christians to love your neighbor, meaning to kind of show this general shallow love to everyone's feelings around us. This is a, a deeper term of endearment to them. Neighbors were blood and bond family kinsmen. That's why Jesus as a boy could be missing for a day and his parents not be worried. Think about that. Some parents, if they don't know where their kid is for five minutes, they, they, they freak out. They're, they're traveling to another city, miles and miles. They don't see Jesus, young boy Jesus, for an entire day, and they're not worried. Three days in, they're like, oh, maybe we should look for him. Three days in, he's, he's fine. Why? Because he's with true neighbors. The account says that they were many friends and, and, and family traveling with them. Their idea of, of neighbor is, is much broader than ours. And so uh, we don't really get it. So maybe we'd get the picture if, if it's like this. Imagine that we all lived in the same neighborhood and that in our, our congregation, we had the baker, we had the mailman, we had the, the uh, bank teller, um, someone had eggs that they shared, someone had milk that, that they shared, someone had bread that they, they shared, um, that our kids grew up together, that um, men and women knew each other well. And so when, when we think of the term neighbor, if we live like that, then how should we love our neighbor? How should we apply to our closest friends? And so um, hopefully you get the idea but I want to bring this, this home a little bit. This is not a generic term um, where often I think Christians are, have this guilt imposed on them. Like we, we, must, we must bear the, the, the collective happiness of the entire world. And we take a term that has deep meaning and we, and we cheapen it. And so to them, neighbor was a qualitative word of intimacy not a quantitative word of proximity. Let me say that again. It was a qualitative word of intimacy, not a quantitative word of proximity. Meaning, if you were a neighbor, you had depth of relationship and, and deep concern. 
It wasn't this, this broad, um, indifferent, impersonal idea. And so, uh, and I think Mr. Rogers had the right idea. Uh, won't you be my neighbor? He wasn't asking them to move into their, their neighborhood. He wasn't asking them to walk by you in the street. He said, get to know me. I want to get to know you. And that was kind of the, 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 the beauty of the show was that he actually took time to get to know people and uh, care for them. So why do we go through great lengths for one word? Um, well, this term is all throughout Proverbs. And so I want you to have the, the, the proper understanding or what they would have understood, um, and it affects this text. Because how we treat one another is an outpouring. It's a reflection of our righteousness. It's a reflection of all the concepts we looked at last week. Now they're being applied, and for us, especially within the church. So all of our theological principles from last week, the one who is, the one who is blessed, who eats of a tree of life, the one who finds wisdom and holds fast to it, the one who, who grasps the creative power of the universe and follows Yahweh, the God of gods and Lord of lords, the son who keeps sound wisdom and who finds life from wisdom, who walks in wisdom, who won't stumble because the Lord keeps him from stumbling. Here's what that looks like this morning in our text. So theologically speaking, this is our orthodoxy leading to our orthopraxy, meaning our right or straight doctrine leads to our right or straight practice. There should not be a distinction between the two. I think for many people, if you're theologically minded, it's easy to know all these propositions about God, but then fail to apply them in your lives. And maybe you're on the other side. Maybe you're, you're, you're so consumed with what you're doing, you don't know why you're doing it. Because you don't know that the theological foundations, we're working out of God's grace and mercy and his, and his wisdom and, and his love, not to earn it. So these two things must be held in the proper balance. And so we're going from the orthodoxy of last week to the orthopraxy of this week. So here's our structure. It's going to be much less complex than the, the, the previous few poems. So... We've got four verses on rules for what not to do. So uh, don't act like this. Four verses on that. One verse on who to reject, who to avoid. Don't act like them. And then four verses on the reason why we do these things. Don't act like this. Don't act like them. Why? Because of the Lord. And so what we're going to see this morning is that our actions are motivated by his dispositions. The actions of his people are motivated by the dispositions of the Lord, what God is inclined to, what he loves, what he hates. That will drive our actions. So if you have not already, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. And I'm going to start reading from verse 21 to give us some context. Because this is a flowing thought. Proverbs 3.21 my son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then, they, then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of, wicked, of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Do not withhold good from those whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. The wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your revelation that you have revealed the divine will to us, that we mere finite creatures 
might be given the wisdom of the ages through Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the word incarnate, and we thank you for the Son. And as him we glorify, as him we exalt, and we thank you for sending your spirit who opens our minds and our eyes to understand these truths and to apply them, to convict us of sin and to remind us of Christ that he may be glorified. So, Lord, we ask this morning that in all things you may be glorified, that your people may be built up in love, that the concern and the loving kindness of our God would be displayed in our love for one another that the world may wonder because you first loved us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so in our first section, in this, this rules section, um, there are four commands, and they're commands against two categories. So the first two are going to be the sins of omission. Second two are going to be the sins of commission. So you may have heard these terms before thrown around in Bible study. Basically, omission, when you omit something, you fail to do it. So the sins of omission are failing to do good when you have the opportunity to do so or the ability to do so. We're going to spend more time on these because I think these are more subtle and these are what we're more often guilty of. The sins of omission. When you can do good, you don't. Then in verse 29 and 30, we're going to get the sins of commission. This is willingly doing evil. This is setting out to planning, desiring, and enjoying evil. So those are our two categories this morning. So starting in verse 27, where he says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. So let's start there. In the, in the Hebrew, this is more of do not hold, withhold good from those who possess it or those who are owners of it. That's what he means by, by do. It's kind of hard to, to translate in, in the English. But those who are deserving of good, give them good. Don't withhold it from them. Um, if it is in your, or when it is in your power to do so. Here's, here's the omission. It's in your power. You're able to do it, but you fail to do it. You refuse to do it. This is harder to spot, but this is a hard issue. And this is not something that, that, that we can look around and say, you're guilty of this sin. We must take account of ourselves because each one of us is guilty in this area. Where we have opportunity to repay good, to do good, to give to whom it is due, yet we hold a little too tightly onto our stuff. Um, so this is, this is kind of the, the heart of the golden rule principle. Do to others as you would have them do to you. I think Romans 13 is helpful here. Uh, it'll be up on the screen, but if you can turn there, turn there. Romans 13, where Paul is talking about within the church. But here's kind of a, a helpful principle. Romans 13, starting in verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So first thing, owe no one anything. Here's the repaying to good, uh, those who are paying good to those who it is due. Uh, Deuteronomy tells us that the borrower becomes a slave to the lender. Owe no one anything. Don't carry around the responsibility and the guilt of not giving what is, is due. Make sure that you um, are above reproach with all. Th and this is love. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments. Notice these commandments are all toward others. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling the law. So in giving one simple command, to do good to whom is good, to, to, to love your neighbor, this is, this is fulfilling the second half of the law. Everything that is required between man and, and man is, is doing to them as you would have them do to you. And so, okay, maybe this is a little abstract, but how do we bring this back home? Like a couple practical situations come to mind. So, oh, no one anything to whom it was due. Let's start here. This is easy. We're all guilty of this one. Borrowing without returning. There are some of you in here who have my books. I'm not, uh, that's, that's not it, but... 
There, but there are also some of you in here who have other people's tools, who have borrowed things. Who are you pointing at, Bubba? Um, <laughs> um, and this is, this is a, a very common thing. Someone hears that you have a need, and they hand you something that, that, that you need. And you're like, great, this meets my need. And six months later, you're like, whose was that again? I know that's not mine. We don't give back to the, okay, maybe that's, that's a little more service level. What about debts? So if you borrowed money, if you've been given money, do you, do you pay it back when you say you were going to? Do you pay it back in a timely manner? Are you living off of debt? Are you dependent on someone else's money? And you are putting off and becoming a slave to that borrower. Are you giving the just due where it's, where, it, where it's due? Are you going out to nice dinners while deferring all of your credit cards? I've met many people who do this, and this is, being, this is being dishonest with your finances. This is not paying off your debts first. Maybe you are an employer. Is your, are your laborers worth their wages? Do you, do you pay someone a fair and generous wage? Or when you hire someone to work in your home, do you pay them on time? Do you, do you pay your bills on time? Do you do you pay a good worker what he's, what he's worth? Or do you look for the cheapest guy out there and wonder why it falls apart a week later? Or maybe you're an employee. Do you do the type of job that you would want someone to do for you? Do you do good for your boss, your employer? Now, we don't often think about these, these things. We don't realize how selfish we are in our day-to-day -day lives. Why do we withhold good? We're greedy, we're selfish, we don't trust the Lord, we don't care about others. We think, well, I want to hold on to a couple more dollars, or I won't pay this back because I really need the money. Your God owns all things and is given richly to you. You don't think he'll, he can replace that and give a little bit more? But we all do, don't we? We try to squirrel away all of our stuff because how we view our possessions, how, hold, how tightly we hold our things says so much about our heart and our theology. Because if our God is really as mighty and powerful and gracious and giving as we know he is, we would not be so greedy and miserly with what he's given us. Amen? Amen. But this is not just a monetary principle. This extends to our actions as well. If we are able to do good to someone, if we're able to serve someone, if we're able to encourage someone, why don't we do it more often? I'll just give one example. This, I, I say it often, but this is one of the most unsung and underappreciated gifts within the church, encouragement. You know how far encouragement goes. If we could see someone who is who is, who is faithful or does a good job or has, has stewarded something well, why don't we think to compliment them? Why is it so hard? For guys especially, why is it so hard? Like we can, we can rip on each other easily, but why is a compliment and encouragement so hard? Why is that not manly? Why can't we give good and do good to those who it is due if we in the church did that, just that one thing, if we did more encouraging one another and complimenting one another and building one another, another up instead of criticizing and, and bickering and complaining, the church would be the shining city on a hill it's supposed to be. I think for the most part, we, we, we do that well. But if you've talked to the average person, Every one of us has been in ugly, if you've been in the church for a while, you've been in ugly church arguments. You've been in those who are looking only out for their, their, their self-interest. They would rather not do, someone, do, do good to someone who has an opposing view. We don't even have to talk about loving the neighbors outside there. We need to work on loving those inside the church first. Amen. So that sets up this idea of neighbor. Verse 28, here's the other sin of omission. 
Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it. When you have it with you. Oh, we're going to have fun with this one. Um, here's why we started with defining neighbor. Uh, one of the Hebrew translators, Robert Alter, translates this as friend. Reads a little differently, doesn't it? Do not say to your friend, go and come again tomorrow I will give it. It gives more intentionality to love your neighbor, love your friend. Go. We'll take care of that later. Now, of course, we are meant to do good to all. In, if it's in our, our power, the way we treat believers and non-believers is a witness. But our first responsibility, Galatians 6.10 be up on the screen. Our first responsibility. So then, as you have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are the household of faith. What is the reputation of Christians? That they're judgmental, that they're critical, that they're, that they're, they're hypocrites. That doesn't come out of a vacuum. It comes out of a pattern. So yes, the way we treat others matters, but it begins within the household of faith. It begins among our true neighbors. This is the pattern of the church. This is why membership in the church is, is defined and depicted the way it is. Of a living organism who is dependent on one another, who builds each other up, who bears one another's burdens, who rejoices with, one, with those who rejoice, who mourns with those who mourn, who is patient and kind and serving and loving. That is what it means to be neighbors, and we are to be the example of that in the church. That is right. Thanks, Mike. Um, but we are so hopelessly individualistic, and if we're honest, 95% of our thoughts are about ourselves, and the other 5% are just listening to the other person just long enough so we can begin talking about ourselves again. Imagine if we looked at our brothers and sisters like that. Imagine if we were not always so consumed with ourselves. This is why it's a little harder for us to understand a text like this, the, the weight of it, because we're in an individualistic culture, not a collectivist culture. Because in the, in the collectivist culture, in the Jewish culture, the group, the village, the town, the, the neighbors are, are bigger than the individual. The whole is greater than the parts. We're individualists. We all want to be shining parts and forget the whole. But biblically, the church is a whole. The body is one. It is a moving, functioning bride. And it is meant to be unified and, and brilliant and dazzling. And so, yes, we are to do good to all, but first and foremost in the church. It doesn't preclude us from doing good to non-believers, but... We can't throw out the rest of Proverbs that calls us to wisdom and discretion. So, the guy who calls you from India telling you that your, um, that your car warranty is up, he's not your friend. The guy emailing you from Nigeria wanting you to send over, your, he's, he's not your friend. Show some discernment. Yes, we can do good to all, but it doesn't mean we have, to be, we, we have to be foolish and throw away what, what God has given us. Now, here's, if it hasn't gotten close to home yet, here's where it's going to. Go and come again tomorrow. Tomorrow is the procrastinator's favorite word. Tomorrow is a magical land where everything I didn't have time for today, I will automatically have more time for tomorrow. Tomorrow is this, this, this wonderful place where I'll have more, more energy, better ideas, and all my problems will be solved. How often does that work out? The procrastinator's favorite word is tomorrow. You know what a productive person's favorite word is? Today. Better yet? Now. Amen. Right. <laughs> Stop looking at my notes. Um, <laughs> Shree's scanning my notes when I go to sleep. Um, no, but I, I want us to think about this. It, it's, it's nice when we have, like, when everyone's a, a, away, then we can just, we'll just have this, like, family discussion and, and Yeah. Um, we'll just go completely informal today. Uh, so do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow, for I'll give it. This is another one, if we're honest, we are all guilty of this. Why do we do this? Why do we procrastinate? 
if we could do good to someone today, why do we put it off to tomorrow? If we're honest, it's probably because we don't want to deal with it, and we hope if we push it out far enough, we won't have to deal with it. And if we're really honest, we hope that if we push out far enough, they won't remember. What does that say about how much we care for others or ourselves? We delay for the same reasons we withhold. Greed, selfishness, indifference. And here's what takes it a step further. Do not say to your, no, to your neighbor, go and come again. Tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. It's worse if you actually have it. If your neighbor, your brother, your sister says, I'm hungry. Or I don't know how I'm going to meet this need. I have no gas in my car. And you got a gas can in the back of, in, in your trunk, and you say, ah, you know, call me tomorrow. What does that say about us? Maybe let's bring it a little closer to home. If you weren't uncomfortable enough, how often do we will say we'll do something for someone in the future and never do it? That is lying. How often are we liars? I'll do that right on it today. You'll have it in your email tomorrow. I'm set, the check is in the mail. Hey, I could really use help with this. I need you for this. Sure, I'll get it done. A day goes by. A week goes by. You're a liar. We're all guilty of that. We don't care about our integrity. We care about saving face. We would rather have someone think that we're admirable to their face than to actually do what is admirable. This is a serious problem. In general, we are not people of integrity. Think about it. How often during a week does someone fail to do what they say they're going to do for you? How often during a week do you fail? Do you just say something because it sounds good coming out of your mouth? Sure, I'll do it. Sure, I'll call you back. Sure, I'll do whatever. Do not say to your neighbor, tomorrow. When you have the ability to do it today. And again, here's the connection between our orthodoxy and our orthopraxy. The gospel drives what it means to be brother or neighbor. Look at 1 John chapter 3. I think many of you who know your Bibles probably knew I was going here. But here's, the, but here's the reason. 1 John 3, verse 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. We got we to gotta build the foundation here first. This, by this we know love. How do we know love? Christ's love for us. What is our measure for any, any way that we treat anyone else? That the Lord of glory humbled himself to take on flesh for us because he loved us. How could we not humble ourselves for someone else? And often it takes a few moments of our time, but yet we're too selfish and we're too self-deluded to do it. The Lord of glory laid down his life for us that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This is the church here. Amen. We like to picture the unity when we sing, when we, when we pray, when we sit under the same sermon, when we read the same text, when we approach the table together. But do we live like that? Or do we just say, yeah, we're the church and we go about our, our separate ways? Do we lay down the lives for our brothers? This is the, the, the theological foundation. Christ died for you, and he died for me. He died to unite us to himself and to one another. This should be the driving force for verse 17. But if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother, his neighbor in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? We have all been guilty of this. We've all been guilty of loving our own stuff and our own time 
and our own talents more than the one that Christ shed his blood for. Forget the world. We don't know how to do this right in the church. And again, this is not everyone all the time. And I think our church is one of the exceptions where people do this well. But we've all been in situations where it's not done well. And if we're lax in this, it's not long before we don't do this well. So we need to be diligent in this. Little children, verse 18, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed in truth. There are some big talkers. There are people who will quickly say, I'll do this. Sign me up. I'm first in line. Then when it's time to actually do it, they're nowhere to be found. Are you loving in deed and in truth or just by lip service? When you speak, do other people say, you know what? I know if he says he's going to do it, if she says she's going to do it, it's as good as done because they keep their word. Or do people wait in suspense when you say something to see if you're actually going to follow through? You know which one you fall under. We should all desire to be known as people who love in deed and truth. All right. Again, that was the, the bulk of this section, the sins of omission. Now here's the sins of commission, getting into verse 29. Um, do not plan. Here's the, 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 the commission, the premeditated planning ahead, premeditated sin. These are easier to spot and easier to avoid, and it sounds obvious because very few of us picture ourselves planning evil against our neighbor. And maybe we don't, but even if we don't carry through with it, how often do we desire in our heart to get over on someone? How often do we fantasize about getting even? How often do we wish that someone else who has something that we wish we had or has done something that we wish they wouldn't and we, we desire harm for them even if we never care, carry through with it? Well, Jesus tells us if you've done it in your heart, you were, you were guilty of it. And that this, that the second half of verse 29 is a great definition for neighbor. Do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. This is a great definition of, of, of neighbor. This is not the random guy on the street. This is the one who dwells trustingly. Trust is an essential part of any healthy relationship. He's been a trusted and good friend. How could you plan evil against him? He dwells beside you. You know when he puts his kids to bed. This is the, the intimacy here which, which makes the betrayal so much more heinous. It's shocking, but it happens all the time. So I want us to think about what does it mean to be a neighbor. Uh, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 10. Because remember I, I, what I mentioned earlier is that our reaction to others or our treatment of others is a reflection of our righteousness. Our treatment of others is a reflection of our righteousness. Here's probably the most uh, famous example of what it means to be a neighbor. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer. All good stories start with and behold, a lawyer. Um, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, this idea of inheritance is going to come up later. Uh, but notice he's trying to put Jesus to the test. It, what lawyers do, he's trying to uh, see what Jesus is really made out of. And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answers with a good answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, and love your neighbor as, you, as yourself. Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. It's just that simple. But he couldn't let it go, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, Jesus beautifully tells a tale. But typically, we, we read this as it's all about the Good Samaritan. And now, th that is part of the moral. But in a collectivist culture, this is an indictment against who should really be a neighbor. 
I want, to, I want you to see a couple details as we read through this. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. No one goes from Jerusalem to Jericho unless they're a practicing Jew. He is, he, he's coming back from worship. This is a righteous man who is, who, is, who is going to pay honor to the Lord. A Jew fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest. Who are the priests? Levites. These are the ministers of the nation of Israel. These are the servants of the people of God. If anyone should be a neighbor to this man, it should be the priests. A priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, another neighbor, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan. Samaritan were the hated half-breeds who had no portion with the kingdom of Israel, who the, the, the Jews would take their time to go walk around Samaria so they wouldn't even have to touch the same ground as the Samaritans. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he sent him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, two days' wages, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Now, here's the important question. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor? Being a neighbor is not just given. It must be proven. It will be showed by your actions. Your, your, your righteousness is displayed by how you treat others. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is as much an incur or a commendation to the Samaritan as it is an indictment to the neighbors of Israel who should have been neighbors but weren't. So it's in the same vein as our Proverbs passage. Um, next one, verse 30. Do not contend with a man for no reason. I love this, this, this Hebrew word because it's a metaphorical idea of to seize someone by the hair. Do not contend. It's like you can't, you can't fight 101. You just grab their hair and don't let go. Aha, I got you. Uh, yeah, like my nieces and nephews love to grab my, my beard. It is not any more fun when it's here versus here. <laughs> but this idea of you want to you, you hold on to someone and struggle with them. Don't do that for no reason. Why is this so common even within the church? Even if we don't do it physically, this metaphorical idea, how often do we struggle with people we should love? Because we don't listen well. We don't communicate well. We don't care to reconcile. We want to be right. We want to grab them by the sides of their head and shake some sense into them so they come over to our side. Why do we do that? Don't contend with a man. This is, this is more, more general here. This is Adam again, man. Don't, don't contend with, with Adam for no reason. Now, sometimes there are reasons, and Proverbs will tell us, like, contend with, with your neighbor who brings a false accusation against you, but do it rightly. But this is foolish to do it when there's, when there's no reason to, when he's done no harm to you. This is literally in the Hebrew, when he's done no evil to you. So there's a connection to verse 29. Don't plan evil, and don't contend with a man when he's done no evil to you. Don't repay evil with evil and don't get involved in, in evil. This sounds like half the internet right now. Right? That all of a sudden, I don't know you, I don't know what, you, what you've done, and how often are we tempted to get into those stupid arguments? They've done no evil to you, but you want to create a character and, and uh, point fingers, or you want to root for one side or, or the other. It's, it's, it's foolish. Getting in a fight on the internet is like getting in a boxing match with an ugly person. They don't care if they get hit in the face. So, 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 so don't do it. 
<laughs> that's, a, a, that's one of my favorites. You'll hear that again in about another year or so. All right, so that's the second sin of commission. Don't plan evil. Don't pull out someone's hair for no reason. And now you've got this uh, middle verse here. Do not envy a man of violence. Do not choose any of his ways. So this is, this is kind of contrasting the good and righteous neighbor versus the unrighteous neighbor. This is the epitome of the unrighteous neighbor. Don't envy or don't choose. He's basically saying don't act like, don't, don't desire, don't even associate with. Reject any of the inclinations of the man of violence. The man of violence is someone who loves conflict, who plans evil. And this is the antithesis, the complete opposite of what the father wants the son to be. Do not be a man of violence. Don't resort to this. But why I say this? Why I say a man of violence? Like that seems pretty extreme. Maybe we're more tempted to, to admire the rich. But remember, this is written to a young man. And in those days, much more than ours, young men went to war. And even in our day, uh, you don't have to really give men much of a push. We are drawn to violence. Our inclinations are to violence. You don't have to teach a three-year-old to run up and, and punch you. They are little wretched sinners. They, 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 they desire violence. And that, that must be trained and disciplined out of them. Because little sinners who love violence, who are not disciplined, and it's, and it's cute when a three-year-old does it, but if they're not disciplined and they, and they grow up to be men who love violence, it's really not cute. We live in a culture. Hollywood feeds into this. Video games feed into this. We wonder why we have school shooters. Because you have young men who are not disciplined, who are surrounded by, by violence day in and, and, and day out, and everybody's fine cashing in, and they wonder, why is there violence? Why are people robbing and, and, and looting? Why are people beating people on the street for no reason? Because they're wicked. There's no fear of the Lord within them. There's, there, there, there's no discipline. Don't envy them. Don't go after the man who hates life, who hates peace, who loves to strive and argue and quarrel. Avoid that man. Hopefully you are not that man. All right, in our last section here, starting in verse 32. For the devious person... Um, all right, so let's kind of contrast here. This is our last section. So he's, con he's contrasting the two ways and outcomes, all separated with but. I don't know if you caught that. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. Here's the why. Don't do this. Avoid this. Here's why. Here's the reason for everything we just said. Here's the, the, the theological motivation for all this. So the Lord's disposition, meaning his state of mind, is our motivation. Let me say that again. The Lord's disposition should be our motivation. We don't look to what pleases ourselves or what builds up the individual. What honors the Lord? What does he desire? What does he reward? What does he curse? That is our motivation. That's why verse 32 begins with, don't envy this, this man of violence or don't choose any of his ways for or because the devious person is an abomination to the Lord. This is why it matters. Look at the Lord's treatment of the righteous and the wicked. This word devious, it means twisted. It means perverse. It means it is not straight. This is an abomination. The word abomination is the highest offense to the Lord. Why? Because someone who does abominable acts, they plan, they execute, and they enjoy what is contrary to God's design with no regard for him or his people. They are a devious person. These people, they promote perversion. That's what abomination it is. It is, it is promoting perversion. It's not just being complicit. It is 
It is being in the middle of it. It is working in it and, and, and loving it. The devious person, the twisted person is an abomination to the Lord. But the upright or the straight, these, these two words are drawn or in the Hebrew are to draw a contrast. The crooked person is an abomination, but the straight person, they are in his confidence. In his confidence, in, in the Hebrew, the, the sense is he's, they're drawn into his inner circle. They are, they, are, they are given the insight of the Lord. Remember when Jesus did this with his disciples. He would preach one message to the larger group, and they'd be confused, and he'd speak to them in parables. But when he pulls his disciples closer, he gives them the meaning of the parables. I think we lose the awe and wonder that through the Holy Spirit, we have the mind of Christ. And when we open the scriptures, we're brought into God's counsel. This is my divine will and desire for you. This is who I am, and this is how you can honor me and be in fellowship with, with me. But we take that for granted. We go through our lives and forget that God has brought us into his confidence. Have you ever been entrusted with something of great value? Have you ever had anyone give you their, 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 their child for a day? or something that is so valuable to them, there is an honor and privilege that you want to hold this. We have been entrusted with the knowledge of God. We have been entrusted with the good news of Jesus Christ. There is nothing more valuable. We are brought into God's inner circle with this. Do we realize how great a privilege and an honor that is? What else does he say here? The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. First thing I want you to see, there's two words here that are uh, placed in opposition to one another, house and dwelling. The first word, it's just a structure. It's just a set of walls that people sleep in. There is, there is no life. It's just a utilitarian building. But the second one, dwelling. This is a Hebrew word that, that, that means grazing land for animals. It's a place of safety. It's a place of comfort. It's a place of provision. The Lord curses the house, the very structures of the wicked. But he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. The righteous God dwells with as a good shepherd dwells with his sheep. There is a concern for the house of the righteous. This idea of, of dwelling is one of the most predominant in all of Scripture. This is the story of the Bible. God dwelling with man. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. In the creation, what was the epitome of, of the um, Imago Dei, that, that Adam is created in the image of, of God, that he get to walk with God. God dwelled with him in the cool of the day and walking through the garden. There's this, there's this relationship between God and man. What was the, what was the uh, punishment when the fall came, when sin came into the world, that, that now he was cut off from the garden? Man, Adam and Eve, and all of mankind after them were cut off from the fellowship with the living God. They could no longer dwell with him. They were separated from his dwelling place because of their sin, and they were cursed to roam the earth. What was the solution? The solution was God dwelling among man. There was a shadow of it in the Old Testament when they created a tabernacle, a dwelling place for God, a reminder that God is separate from you, but he will be among you. But it is something new entirely and something different and never to be repeated that God takes on flesh and dwells among man. What was lost in the garden is now in bodily form to reconcile man to God. And what was accomplished at the cross was the fulfillment of that reconciliation. Because what do we see at the end? What do we see at the consummation of all things? Man now dwells with God in new heavens, in new earth forever. And so this here is a little glimpse that when you are righteous, when you honor the Lord, your house becomes a dwelling. It becomes a place of comfort and security where God dwells with you. And this is a beautiful encouragement to his people. But if you are the wicked, it is a curse. Now, here's what this doesn't mean. 
This doesn't mean that everything that the, the, that the wicked do will be cursed from an earthly perspective. We've all seen the wicked prosper. We live in a day where the wicked seem to be prospering at an alarming rate. But even in their prosperity, they are under a curse. Even in the biggest mansion, it is a cursed house of death. Because the curse that was given to Adam and Eve is still on them. Because they are still in their father, Adam. The curse of the Lord is still on them. Because death and depravity are still batting a thousand. There is no one unaffected by the curse that has affected all of the cosmos. But there's an answer. Either that curse still remains on you, or that curse was placed on Christ. That's why we, we love Galatians 3, 13, and 14, uh, which says, and Paul speaking of the law, but the idea of the curse applies here. Galatians 3, 13, and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, everyone, er, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree by the cross. That curse that by nature and by choice is laid on all of mankind is laid on Christ. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Praise the Lord. That even in poverty, even in nothing, we live in a house of, of blessing. You would trust me. You would much rather have Christ bear your, your, your curse and have none of the world's material goods than to live in the riches of the world and be under the curse forever. You can have all the abundance and favor of men under the curse and it will all vanish. You can have nothing in this world and be a king in glory forever. Amen. All right, verse 34. Winding down here. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. This is basically what you reap, you will sow. Live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Here's the scorner. The scorner who is, is one who is defiant and disrespectful. The scorner is one who stands in opposition and lets you know it. Notice what the Lord is doing here. Toward the scorners, he is scornful. You don't want to see that side of the Lord. You don't want to see the Lord being scornful. You don't want to see the Lord looking at you face to face and defying you and saying, I am in opposition to you. I have nothing to do with you and I hate you. That is the future of the scornful. Yet the humble, he gives favor. Now this is not humble in disposition but this is or demeanor but this is humble in stature this is the poor the oppressed the afflicted the lowly and i love what jesse said earlier when we see the mentions of the manger in luke 2 it reminds us of jesus's lowliness because of the lowly one because of the one who humbled himself and took on flesh and became least among all servant to all he received the favor and the glory of God, and through him, we too who are poor in spirit, who are lowly in this world, not like the man of violence, we will receive the favor of God because he came before us. And even if we're not good at being lowly, even if we are prideful and we are arrogant and we stumble and we fail in each one of these negative commands that we saw earlier, he is still the lowly one on our behalf. He is still the one who fulfilled what the law requires. He is still the one who took away the curse, even if we keep running back to the cursed parts of our former selves. This verse here is used in both in 1 Peter 5, which we'll handle when we come back in January in our Wednesday night Bible study, but in James 4 also. I want you to look at James 4. Look at James 4, do some application, then we'll land the plane in verse 35. We're circling the runway, but it's okay. 
Thanks for getting that. All right, James 4. Look at James 4, verse, verse 1. Now, now remember, this is the church. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Don't contend with a man for no reason. Is it not that your passions are at war within you? This is a hard issue. You desire and do not have, so you murder. He's speaking to Christians here. You murder in your heart. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly. So often people are like, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed to get this new job and it doesn't happen. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed to get the guy or to get the, the girl or to have more money and it doesn't happen. Why? Because you ask wrongly. Because you ask selfishly to spend it on your passions. Why are those commands needed in Proverbs? Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Because our passions are selfish. We don't think of others, we think of ourselves. You adulterous people, verse 4, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Do not love this wicked man. Do not love the man of violence. Don't, don't, don't covet what he does. Don't even think about it. Because if you're friends with him, you're an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is of no purpose that the scriptures say he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Here's that, that, that dwelling. God sent the spirit to dwell in us so that we wouldn't be like the world, so that we would be a place of peace, a place for his dwelling, because we are his sheep. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud. Same verse here, uh, quoting from the, the, the Septuagint. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Repent. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Well, that's pretty morbid, isn't it? If you know how sinful and wretched you are, this should be you. Because if you do that... Humble yourself. Don't exalt yourself. You humble yourself. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. To the humble, he gives favor. There's a temptation to be arrogant in the righteousness given us by Christ, but we cannot. Final verse. The wise will inherit honor, but the fools get disgrace. Here's the purpose of this entire book. The way of the wise and the way of the foolish. Two words here, honor and disgrace. The Hebrew word for, uh, for, for honor, kavod, it means heavy. The, the, the root of it means heavy. It is something weighty. The root word is of disgrace is associated with something light. There's another Hebrew play on words. The wise will inherit the weighty thing. The fools, they will get the light, the uh, worthless thing, the thing of no value. This word inherit here, again, something that is lost in our individualistic culture. But in their culture, an inheritance was everything. It was the family name. It was the family honor. It was, it was generational prosperity or famine. If you had a good inheritance, you were set for the rest of your life and the rest of your children's lives. And your, your name would be known because of your good inheritance. Remember the ruler, or excuse me, the, the lawyer in Luke 10. He wanted to inherit eternal life by his own righteousness. He wanted to justify himself. How can I inherit eternal life because of how good I am? But that's not the picture here. What is more amazing is that Christ is the heir of all things. He is the fullness of wisdom. He took on flesh as the lowly one to inherit the heavens and the earth that we might share the inheritance with him. Here's where I want to land, Titus 3. Titus 3, 4, and 7. We will close with this. It sounded British there, Titus 3, 4, and 7. Uh, Titus 3, verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that 
being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Fools get disgrace, what is worthless. The righteous, the righteous are co-heirs with Christ for the eternal weight of glory. Praise the Lord if you are counted with Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We praise you. You are a great and awesome God. You are merciful. You are abounding in steadfast love. We don't deserve your favor. We don't deserve your grace, your mercy. We don't deserve your love. We don't deserve the righteousness of Christ, but you have given it to us. Lord, may we be thankful and grateful people. May we be faithful with what you've given us, with our time, our talents, our, our, our treasures. May we be good neighbors, both in the church and without. May we glorify you in everything we say and do because we know what it means to love. We know what it means to lay our life down because you took on flesh and laid down your life for us. May we do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.